Well, it's good to see so many of you here, and we really want you to uh, enjoy the weekend and to get a lot of information that you'll be able to take to others as well. I know a number of you have probably seen uh, the movie I was in, The Genesis Solution. How many of you have seen that? Quite a number. Well, that's great. Good to see it's getting around. It has a message that we believe is, is very, very important, and also it helps uh, Americans understand good English, uh, which is uh, <laughs> another reason why we have it. Actually, it's... I was telling one of the groups this week that when we first arrived in America, and I live in San Diego now and work with the Institute for Creation Research, which is the largest creation organization in the world. When we first arrived here, I know my children said, Daddy, they speak funny, which uh, gave me great opportunity to explain how sin had affected language. <laughs> so, and particularly when you go to Texas, you understand what that means. Well, did you hear about the, the Texan and the Australian? Uh, the, the Tex there was an Australian who went to Texas and, uh, and the Texan said, do you know it takes me three days to get across my property in my car? And the Australian said, yeah, I had a car like that once too. <laughs> so you see, we have a different way of looking at things and I trust over this weekend that uh, you appreciate the way we look at things. Well, we're going to be talking about the creation evolution issue and talking about Genesis, our program is called Back to Genesis. If you're wondering why it's called Back to Genesis, if you think about it, marriage goes back to Genesis, sin back to Genesis, death back to Genesis, why Jesus died on a cross back to Genesis, why we need a new heavens and new earth back to Genesis, why man has dominion back to Genesis, why we, we work back to Genesis. In fact, if you've wondered why we call it Back to Genesis, that's part of the reason. Because of all our doctrine, ultimately, as Christians, goes back to which book? Genesis, that's right. But of course today, a lot of people don't believe in Genesis. In fact, we went out and had a look at a, a very uh, objective and unbiased display at the St. Louis Zoo. And uh, <laughs> while we're out there, we noticed that uh, people out there don't believe in Genesis, they believe in evolution. And in fact, they have this special display there. But you know, it, it's unfortunate, but many, many people these days are told, if you believe in evolution, that's the scientific view of origins. But if you believe in this stuff these creationists believe, that's religion. You've heard that before, haven't you? But I want to say to you right from the start tonight that evolution's not science, never has been, cannot be, uh, will not be, won't be. Evolution really is plain straight religion. Now that sounds like a fairly uh, dogmatic sort of statement, but uh, I want you to think about that for a moment. You see, even if I'm in kindergarten or university, I like to ask people a very simple question. You look at this particular diagram here. Millions of years ago, chemicals turned into some sort of cell. All right, who was there to see it? According to evolutionists, no one. Who was there to see this primordial soup? No one. How do they know it happened? They don't know it happened. They don't know it happened. They weren't there. You know, I was talking on Boston radio about this once and a university professor called up and he said, but look, he said, we're doing experiments in a laboratory, or you falsely call it laboratory. And he said, we're doing experiments in a laboratory and one day we're going to make life in a laboratory. And we may, when we make life in a laboratory, we're going to show you creationists are wrong because we'll have shown evolution by chance. And as he said that, I, I thought about it and I said to him, but sir, as you're doing those experiments, you're putting intelligence into your experiments. And he yelled at me over the telephone, we are not putting intelligence into our experiments. <laughs> Well, I was inclined to agree with him at first. <laughs> but you know, that's the point, isn't it? I had to marvel today as I looked at that uh, Living World exhibit at the St. Louis Zoo, said to be a prototype for zoos around the world. All the technology and all the design that went into teaching children that life evolved by chance random processes. And I thought to myself, how inconsistent, how illogical. But you know, when you start to think about it, what evolution really is, of course, it's a belief about the past based on the words of men who don't know everything who weren't there who try to explain how the evidence of the present got there. Have you ever thought about the fact that all the evidence that a scientist has only exists when? In the present, doesn't it? You think about it. For instance, put your hands up if you exist in the present. That's above average for America. That's, that's not bad at all. That, that's about 70%. You know, one of the problems I had as a teacher was that not all my students existed in the present. It was a little bit of a problem. You all exist in the present. In fact, the world exists in the present. The universe exists in the present, doesn't it? The Grand Canyon exists in the present. The fossils exist in the present. All the evidence a scientist has exists in the present. When you think about that, then you say to yourself, that means creationists and evolutionists have the same evidence, don't they? Yes, why? We've got the same world. So we've got the same facts. So you know, the fight is not really about facts. The fight's about 
what you do with those facts and how you explain them in relation to the past. And we're going to talk more about that this weekend. And what I wanted to share with you tonight is a sort of an overview. I wanted to say this to you. As creationists, and we make no apology for the fact that we're not just creationists, we're Christians, we believe that the Bible is the revealed word of the God who created this universe. And we believe that he's told us in there what has happened in the past. In fact, in the book of Genesis, and Genesis means origins, he tells us what has happened in the past. And one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is this. What we do as Christians is this. We take the word of one who knows everything, who's always been there, and we build our science on that to explain the evidence of the present and connect it to the past. And so what I wanted to do was to show you what we believe. Even if you're not a Christian, at least you'll understand what we believe when I go through this to give you this overview. And if you're uh, an evolutionist and you've read uh, your, your unbiased news reports that we get across this nation, and they're not so unbiased, you'll find. Because, you see, a lot of what you read about what they say we believe, we read these things and say, we don't say that, we don't believe that. I can't believe some of the things they write about us. But I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Where do you really start? Where do you put your faith and trust? In the words of God who knows everything who was there, who told us what happened, or the words of men who don't know everything who weren't there, who don't really know what happened? Have a think about that for a moment. We're going to talk more about that over the weekend. In fact, just recently, I was uh, on uh, Moody Radio and I was having an interesting interaction. It was sort of like a debate, actually, with a professor from, Cal uh, from uh, Wheaton College. You might have heard of Wheaton College and Professor Paddle Pun. And, of course, uh, he was telling me that most of the uh, science faculty there believe in evolution and most of the Bible faculty would accept uh, millions of years and things like that. And we were debating this on radio. And I said, you know, the difference between me and you is this. You take the words of men who don't know everything who weren't there and tell God what he means, whereas I take the word of God who does know everything who was there and tell you what's truth and where you're wrong. It was an interesting way to start the conversation. <laughs> so I'm going to, tonight, do exactly what I believe we should do, start with the words of God who knows everything who was there and show you what we believe as creationists, talk about the history of the world as the Bible tells us and show you how we can fit the evidence to that and explain the evidence. Incidentally, don't think that we can prove creation. We can't scientifically prove there was a flood. I know that I've had uh, people say to me, you know, how could a world flood do what you're saying it did around the world? We've never seen one. Well, if we had, we wouldn't be here, if you think about it. But, you know, there is one who, who did see it, who's, who did tell us what happened, and that's in the Scriptures. And I believe the evidence is consistent with that. But let's start at the beginning. It's a good place to start and uh, see what the Bible says. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that's interesting, you know. It says that he made everything in six days. In fact, when you add up all the, all the dates in the Bible, it comes to just thousands of years, not millions of years. And immediately people are going to say, but look, we know there was a big bang billions of years ago. And out of that big bang eventually came the sun and the earth as a hot molten blob. You ever read Job chapter 38? In Job 38, God asked Job a question. Actually, he was teaching him, I believe, the philosophy of science. He said, Job, were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, it's a good question to ask. If you ever see Carl Sagan on television saying, billions and billions of years ago, the Big Bang or something like that, you need to call him up on the telephone. Excuse me, Carl, were you there? Do you know someone who was? You must have a movie rerun. How about Polaroid pictures? How about Doctor Who's time machine? Did you go back and have a look? I mean, they don't have any of that. And you think about that. Were you there? How do you know? It's like people who stand at the Grand Canyon and say, it's obvious it formed over millions of years. Were you there? It's not so obvious, is it? It exists today. You didn't see it form. How do you know what really happened? In fact, how do you know the universe began billions of years ago? Oh, but we got dating methods like carbon-14. I can't believe the number of people that say that. There's this misconception out there that people think carbon-14 has proved the Earth is billions of years old. Carbon-14 has nothing to do with billions of years. It only has to do with thousands of years. The millions or billions of years comes from things like uranium lead and rubidium strontium and potassium argon. And Dr. Austin's going to talk about that tomorrow. And, you know, he'll share things like this with you. When they dated uh, the, uh, lava flow on the bottom of the Grand Canyon using rubidium strontium, it dates to about a billion years old or so. Now, when they date a lava flow on the top of the Grand Canyon, if you use the same method, it should be hundreds of millions of years younger, but it's hundreds of millions of years older which, as the evolutionists would say, see, you can't use that method on the top lava flow. Or as the creationists say, see, you can't use that method. There's a problem. 
You know, all dating methods have incredible assumptions. In fact, something like 50% of all dates are never published anyway. And you know, most people don't realise the idea of millions of years was built up before they had these dating methods. And they will usually want to know where you found a rock so they know how old it is, so they know which date to select anyway. That's really how it works. Uh, we have a geologist in Australia, Dr Andrew Snelling, and he worked with some scientists who dated the uranium in the Northern Territory. And they used two uranium methods and, and a thorium method. Thorium is supposed to be the most accurate. But when they published their dates, they didn't publish the thorium dates because they gave the worst results. Because they gave dates back to zero years, up to millions of years whereas the uranium ones gave dates that were more acceptable with what it should have been in accord with what the nearby rock strata said, which had been determined by evolution in the first place. So you see, the next time you read an academic magazine like Reader's Digest or something like that, and it says, you know, we dated this particular fossil or this rock and it's millions of years old, you need to say to yourself, oh yes, I need to put in brackets. According to the particular dating method they used, even though they didn't uh, use other dating methods because they didn't accept those because they didn't give the dates that they wanted, and even though there are a great number of assumptions for all those dating methods, etc., 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 you need to put that in brackets the next time that you read those sorts of things. And most people don't think of that. In fact, you know, there is a lot of evidence that would suggest you can explain the geological formations, you can explain this universe within thousands of years, not millions of years. I'd like to show you, for instance, an interesting quote from uh, John Eddy, a high-altitude astronomer uh, here in the uh, United States. In 1978, he said, there is no evidence based solely on solar observations that the sun is 4.5 billion years old. I suspect, he said, that the sun is 4.5 billion years old. However, given some new and unexpected results to the contrary and some time for frantic recalculation and theoretical readjustment, I suspect we could live with Bishop Usher's value for the age of the Earth and sun. I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence in astronomy to conflict with that. Rather interesting quote, isn't it? Archbishop Usher, of course, said creation was about, what, 6,000 years ago. Of course, that's rather radical, isn't it? Six, how could you explain things within 6,000 years? Well, we're going to show you this weekend, we believe you can fit the history of this world into a much shorter time frame than what many people think. Make sure you're here tomorrow to hear more about that. But of course, then I have a lot of people say, but look, those days can't be ordinary days. I mean, those days must be long periods of time. You know, I believe the major reason that Christians say that or theologians say that is because I think they take the words of men who don't know everything, who weren't there, who've talked about millions of years, and then they reinterpret the Bible. That's what I think they do. In fact, Dr. Pun, who I was talking about before from Wheaton College, he makes a certain statement in one of his writings. He says, if you read Genesis in a straightforward manner, and you just take it literally, six days, death after Adam, global flood. But he puts a little phrase in without a hermeneutic based on science. Do you know what he's saying? If you take Genesis literally, that's what it says, but you've got to listen to what the scientists say to tell God what he means. I don't believe you can do that. I think you've got to listen to what God says and tell the scientists where they're wrong. Because you see, God's the one that knows everything, not the scientists. And you know, when you think about it, the word used in Genesis uh, 1 for day, the word yom, that Hebrew word, do you know when it's used with a number Anywhere else in the Old Testament, in fact, 357 times, do you know it always means an ordinary day? And the words evening and morning, they're used 38 times elsewhere in the Old Testament, they always mean an ordinary day. In Genesis 1, the word yom is combined with number and evening and morning as if the Hebrew scholar was saying, I want to tell you folks, this is an ordinary day, there's absolutely no other way of taking it. And you know, I have people say to me, oh, but that's too simplistic approach. You know, theologians often say to me, but you're too simplistic. Why do we want to make things complicated? Why can't we just accept what the scripture says? Oh, but look, it's not what Genesis says that's important, it's what it means. I'm not sure it can mean anything if it doesn't say anything, if you think about it. <laughs> in fact, if you applied that theology in your driving, which many of you do, I've looked around here, you come up to one of these octagonal signs that's painted red and it has STOP on it, and you say, I wonder what that means. I know what it says, but what does it mean? You know. If our theology is like that, we've got problems, haven't we? If you think about it, by the way, Adam was made on day six, lived through day six and day seven, died when he was 930 years old. If each day is a million years, you've got problems. You know, I often wondered, actually, why God took so long. And he tells us why he took so long. 
He says in Exodus 20, I worked for six days and rested for one and you ought to do the same. It's the basis of our seven day week. He didn't say, I worked for six million years and rested for one million years, now you do the same, did he? Maybe the Eastern Airline pilots take it that way, but you know that's not what the Lord meant at all. He worked for six days and rested for one. That's where our seven day week comes from. Unfortunately, many people have succumbed to the ideas of men who weren't there and tell God what he means. I'm going to tell you another important reason in one of the other sessions, and we may get onto it um, this evening too, as to why those days need to be ordinary days. But let's go on. Well, day one, well, let's go back to day one again. He made the earth. It says the sun didn't come till day four. Well, how can you have day and night? He made light. Where did it come from? Guess what? I haven't got a clue. Why? He didn't tell me. Why didn't he tell me? If he told me everything, I'd have an infinite number of books and it wouldn't fit in my house. See, God only tells us what we need to know. He didn't tell us where the light came from on day one. might have come from himself. But we have light and we have evening and morning. we got one day. What's the problem? He made the sun on day four. You know, I know people say, but, but can't you believe in the Big Bang Theory and add it to the Bible? The Big Bang Theory says matter, what? existed eternally or came from nowhere for no reason but there was this big explosion then you get the sun and the earth as a hot molten blob the bible says the earth was created covered with water carl sagan's wrong why he wasn't there god was it's as simple as that and you know something that fascinated me you ever read second peter 3 it says in the last days you know this this world's going to be judged by fire and in verse 10 of second peter 3 it says there's the um, elements will melt with fervent heat and there'll be a great noise do you know what hit me the Big Bang hasn't happened, it's going to come. <laughs> they got it the wrong way round. Right, we've got to prepare for the Big Bang. Interesting, isn't it? And by the way, maybe they will be there to see that one. <laughs> well, on day two, God said he separated the waters above from the waters below. He was making the atmosphere. Many creationists believe he put a vapour, uh, a water transparent uh, vapour canopy around the earth so the earth was like a greenhouse as it seems to describe in Genesis 2 where it talks about a mist going up from the face of the ground to water, to water the ground and you know something like a terrarium, you know as you, as you ha if you have a, gl a glass container that's sealed and how the water cycles around, well perhaps the earth was like that, a beautiful place. On day two he was also making the atmosphere with oxygen, ready for life. You know it's interesting, in a typical, in a typical textbook a typical textbook in a public school, I know because I used to teach in public school, they have a, a diagram something like this. They say, look, the original atmosphere didn't have oxygen in it because you see, for uh, life to evolve to get amino acids forming proteins in the presence of oxygen, it just can't happen. They'll burn up, so to speak. And so they say, you must have methane, amenia, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, water vapour. You know, young student, if you're here and you go to a public school and you see this diagram and your teacher says to you, the original atmosphere was like this, put your hand up and ask a question. Excuse me, sir, do you have a sample? Because you know what? They don't have a sample. How do they know it was like that? Excuse me, sir, were you there? No, you weren't there, you don't have a sample. How do you know, sir? And particularly when what even the evolutionists now call the oldest rocks show the presence of, guess which element? oxygen so it's obvious they say so some of them say life didn't evolve on earth after all it evolved in outer space and then came to earth <laughs> i don't think they've really solved the problem do you not at all well on day three god said he raised up the land surface and the plants grew the creation of plants one of the reasons for the plants by the way was for food but it says the waters were gathered together into one place do you know the implication here the implication, if the waters were in one place, what about the land? Maybe it was in one place. Have you ever heard of the idea of a supercontinent to start with that split up? Now, I don't believe it's split up over millions of years. There's some major problems with that. And you talk to our expert, Dr. Steve Austin, about that. There are some major problems. But certainly creationists believe, in fact, they were the first, I think, to write about this, the idea of a supercontinent to start with before the flood. Incidentally, that solves the problem of how the kangaroo got to the ark too, doesn't it? It didn't have to jump across to Indonesia and down that way. You see, there was probably one continent to start with. In fact, it probably looks something like that. <laughs> well, were you there? You don't know it wasn't like that, do you? 
so a little bias comes out in my talk. <laughs> well, I just put that up to illustrate to you that I believe there was one major continent to start with. And God said when he made the plants, he said he made them after their kind. Now that's interesting. If you go on and look in the Bible concerning day five and concerning day six, talks about the creation of sea creatures and birds and the land animals and man but it says about the creation of all the animals that he made them after their kind that phrase occurs a number of times there in genesis he didn't make them after a different kind he made them after their own kind do you know what we'd expect to find animals and plants in distinct groups or kinds and guess what that's exactly what you find but you know here's where evolutionists often say to us but you creationists are ignoring the evidence what do you mean Evolution happens. I had a smile. This week I was on a radio station in a talk show and a man called up and he said to me, are you denying evolution? Are you denying the fact that we don't see evolution around us today and you look at all the species of animals and all the varieties? Are you denying what we don't see? And besides which, when you look at the millions of varieties and species, how could Noah have ever got them on the ark? And I said, well, sir, I said, number one, we need to understand the distinction between kinds and varieties. For instance, we need to look, let me give you an example, sir. If we look at the dog kind, Great Dane, down to Little Chihuahua, dogs, dingoes, wolves, coyotes, jackal, fennet, fox, collish, do you realise they're all the, the dog kind? We know most of them will interbreed and give fertile offspring. They're probably all the same kind. Probably came from something like a wolf kind. You have all these varieties. And the same would go for cat kinds and other kinds. In fact, sir, there's far less number of kinds and there are varieties and if you do some calculations and you knew the size of the ark and you knew the volume that it was and you knew the number of animals that needed to go on the ark there would be plenty of room sir and the interviewer said did he answer your question I heard silence and he said thank you <laughs> <laughs> and that was it because you know what people call up and they ask these questions you know it's like in, in public schools in Australia I used to get a hey, sir how did now get all them animals on the ark eh? Did you understand that? And I used to say to them, well, how many animals did he need to get on the ark? Dunno, sir, but he couldn't have fitted them, could he, eh? Well, tell me, son, what size was the boat? Dunno, sir, but he couldn't have fitted them, could he, eh? Now, there's a student who has some problems with mathematics. You think about it, an unknown number of animals cannot fit in an unknown size boat, so there's no way it could have happened. <laughs> you know, it's even worse when they put their hands up and say, hey, sir, how did Moses get all them animals on the boat, eh? How did he get the dinosaurs on board? Well, son, Moses parted the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land. <laughs> you know, remember when Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands? What did he, before he got there, do you know what was there? Big finches and little finches with big beaks and little beaks. While he was there, what was there? Big finches and little finches with big beaks and little beaks. After he left, what was there? Big finches and little finches with big beaks and little beaks. What's there today? Big finches and little finches with big beaks and little beaks. Is that evolution? No. Look around the room. Big people, little people. Big beaks, little beaks. <laughs> that's not evolution. That's just variation within a kind. And that's all it is. Variation within a kind. And you know, that, that's what many people don't understand. You see, creationists believe in natural selection. Why? It happens. But it only happens within boundaries. One kind doesn't change into another. And so when you look around the room and, uh, world and you see all these varieties, you don't see one kind changing into another. It's like a pig breeder in England said when he found out about evolution. I hope it's not true because I breed pigs and if I don't get pigs, I'm going to go out of business. <laughs> you know, he, he knew the implication of evolution. And you know, that, that's the way it is. You see, what, you, dogs don't change into cats. You have dog kind, you have all these varieties, but they don't change into cats or pigs or something else. You want to see the best evidence against evolution? Go to the Living World exhibit there at St. Louis. And what do you see? You see all these different kinds and pictures of them around the room. Where do you see the in-between forms? They're not there. The only one they've got is that model of Lucy. You see that model of Lucy? You know, she looks half ape and half, well, looks pretty well human all the way up to the head. It looks like an ape head on a human body that's very hairy and, and all that sort of thing. But what they don't tell you, they only found 40% of the skeleton and the knee joint was found two mile away from the rest of the skeleton. And the fact that two of the world's leading evolutionists uh, say it was an upright walking chimpanzee. They don't tell you that bit, of course, do they? You know, here's an interesting quote 
from David Raup, who's a curator of geology at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And he said this in, in 1979. He said, we are now about 120 years after Darwin and the knowledge of the fossil record is greatly expanded. We now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. The record of evolution is still surprisingly jerky. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time. And guess what? Darwin didn't have any. <laughs> One of the problems Darwin said he had with his theory, he didn't have any evidence for his theory. He just hoped it would come a little later on. And of course it didn't. And that's one of the things that he's saying. Well, I just want you to understand when you see the variation uh, around us that that's not evolution, that's variation within a kind and that's all it is, variation within a kind. On day four we're told God made the sun, moon and stars and people say, ah, now you've got a problem, light from the furthest star took millions of years to get here, how do you explain that? Well, number one, we don't really know how far those stars are away. There's a lot of assumptions involved. Number two, we don't really know what's happened to, to light and we don't know a lot of things about that. Uh, some people have suggested light may have slowed down. There's a lot in astronomy we don't know. In fact, astronomy is one of those sciences that there are a phenomenal number of assumptions that most people don't realise. I mean, you take it. They write a whole book about a black hole and they don't see anything. I mean, you think about that sort of thing. You see... I'm not an astronomer, I'm not going to talk to you about that. There is an excellent book though uh, on astronomy in the Bible and it, it's out there on the book tables which has a uh, hundred of the most asked questions about astronomy and uh, I'll share that with you later. But the sun didn't come till day four. You know why I think God left the sun till day four? Maybe it's because down through the ages pagan cultures worship the sun and they say the sun gave birth to life. Even evolution basically says that if you think about it. And maybe God left the sun till day four to show he could create the earth and sustain it and the sun was to be the light holder from that time onward on day four. On day five he made the sea creatures and the birds and on day six he made the land animals and the man. And you know, I do believe they're ordinary days. In fact, let me show you an interesting quote. And this is from Professor James Barr, his well-known Hebrew scholar. He does not believe Genesis is history, but you know what he says? As far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey these three things. Creation took place in a series of days that were 24 hours, as you can see on that quote there. Secondly, you can add up the genealogies to come to the age of the earth, which is only thousands of years. And thirdly, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide. Isn't that interesting? He's a Hebrew scholar and he says, let's face it, folks, that's what the Bible says. Now, he doesn't believe it, uh, it's history, but as a Hebrew scholar, he says, that's what it means. Well, why don't Christians believe it? Because they take the words of men who weren't there and they tell God what he means. And that's a problem that we all suffer from. Well, on day six, God made the land animals and he made man. You know, if those days are ordinary days and he made land animals and man on day six, he must have made... Real animals like kangaroos, koalas, wombats, real animals, bears, deer, squirrel, American animals. <laughs> but you know some other land animals? Parasaurolophus, Pachycephalosaurus, Struthiomimus, Psittacosaurus, Tanistrophius, Allosaurus, heard of those sort of names? What do we call them? Dinosaurs. When did God create dinosaurs? I believe he created dinosaurs on day six because they're the land animals and the reptiles that lived in the oceans uh, at the time of the dinosaurs supposedly according to evolution I believe he made them on day five and so on day five and day six I be believe he made these creatures we call dinosaurs or these these uh, plesiosaurs and and uh, creatures like the pteranodon and so on in fact I can prove that to you because I have a photograph that Eve took in the Garden of Eden and uh, <laughs> There you can see dinosaurs and people living at the same time. Of course, people look at that and they say, now that can't be right, why not? Well, I mean, look at Tyrannosaurus. Yes, we can look at Tyrannosaurus. In fact, uh, Dr. Gish will talk to you a bit about dinosaurs tomorrow. We had uh, over 2,500 children here on Thursday morning and we talked to them about dinosaurs. 
It was really phenomenal. You know there's a real hunger in this nation for people wanting answers to, to what's going on? I was on a secular radio station tonight for 45 minutes. It was to be a 10-minute interview. They got so many calls, I went till seven, 6 o'clock and then, then that was the end of the interviewer's time. And do you know that, that not one person on the secular program was against what I was saying? It was phenomenal. And you know, the educators, unfortunately, at this nation have been able to get evolution taught as fact and yet, you know, a lot of people really... They might, a lot of people might accept millions of years and so on, but underneath it all, it's like one guy called up on the phone, you know, and he said, I no way I'm going to believe I came from an ape. <laughs> but you know, a lot of people say, how could dinosaurs and people live at the same time? I mean, Tyrannosaurus, look, look at his sharp teeth. He, he would have ripped up Adam. Well, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, originally, all the animals ate only what? Plants. They were vegetarian. I've had people say to me, but, but... Look, it, many animals have real sharp teeth. It's obvious they're meat eaters. No, it's obvious they have sharp teeth. That's all that's really obvious. You see, originally, if what the Bible says is true, the animals were vegetarian. Now, I know today we see around the world looks like animals were designed to kill other animals and things like that. I think we have to recognise that when sin came into the world that... Uh, Maybe as a part of the curse, something happened to something, uh, some of the animals. Maybe God created them with those characteristics ready for the fallen world because he knew it was going to fall. Or maybe some of those characteristics were used for something else in the pre-fall world. There's a number of things we can look at in relation to that. But what I do know is this. There was no death when God made the world. Plants were eaten, but they don't die in the sense that animals do because they're not alive in the sense that animals are. They don't have a nepesh or a soul. Plants were made for food, but there was no animal death. And you know, let's stop and look at that for a moment. If you take Romans 5.12, it says, man's actions led to sin, which led to what? Death. Many Christians say, wasn't that just spiritual death? Look at 1 Corinthians 15. It compares the death of the first Adam and the death of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. It's not just spiritual death. It's talking about physical death also. Well, look at Genesis 3. God sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden so they wouldn't eat of the tree of life and live forever. It's obviously physical death as well as spiritual death. Now, why am I emphasizing that? Well, when you read Genesis, it fits that there was no physical death because the animals were vegetarian. We were created to be vegetarian. What'd you have for supper? Got you worried. Guess what? In Genesis 9, after the flood, God said we could eat meat. I'm glad about that because I like steak. Must appeal to my sinful nature, but that's the way it is. But you know, originally we were vegetarian. You know what the Bible says? There's going to be a future state. It talks about it in Isaiah and Revelation, in which there'll be no more death and the animals will be vegetarian. What does Hebrews 9 say? Verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins go back to genesis what do you find when god made adam and eve they rebelled and as a result of that rebellion sin came into the world what did god do he killed animals because it says he gave them coats of skins what's that a blood sacrifice as a covering for their sin as a picture of something to come what am i saying to you i'm saying this god brought in death and bloodshed because of sin so man could be redeemed and I'm going to suggest this to you very strongly. If you take Genesis through to Revelation, I believe the Bible teaches most adamantly there was no physical death and bloodshed of animals or man before Adam sinned. God brought in death and bloodshed because of sin as a means by which man could be redeemed. And I'm going to say this to you. If there was death and bloodshed before Adam sinned, you've wiped out the message of the cross. You've wiped out Christianity. And for those many, many Christians who say you can believe in evolution and add it to the Bible, they've immediately accepted death before Adam because evolution teaches death over millions of years brought man into existence. The Bible teaches there was no death and bloodshed of animals before man. And you know what? We need to get that into every theological and Bible college in America because most of them would accept some form of evolution. Let me tell you this. If you accept the days in Genesis are long periods of time, Guess what you've accepted? Death before Adam. Because you see, the idea of millions of years is uh, referring to those sediments that have these dead things in them. As soon as you accept millions of years, if you say, oh, but I can accept millions of years and, and, and not accept evolution, it doesn't matter. As soon as you've accepted millions of years, you've accepted death before Adam. If you believe in the gap theory, heard of the gap theory? Do you know what it accepts? 
death before Adam. You see, the gap theory was a compromised position. Think about the theological inconsistency. You cannot have death before Adam. If that's true, and over the world you've got all these billions of dead things and rock layers laid down by water, how do you get them after Adam sinned then? Well, the Bible says there was a world flood. Well, if there was, what would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. What do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. By the way, I love saying that. It's one of my favourite phrases. You'll, you'll, you'll just hear that now and then as, as I talk about it. All these billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Well, God said that he made Adam. And then he told them to be fruitful and multiply. And so they did. But you know, we look at that and we laugh, but you know, it's exactly what the evolutionists really believe. They believe that our ancestor looks something like that. And of course, many of you will remember going to school and you were taught how ape-like creatures evolved into people. And we'll do more of this in one of the other sessions with Dr. Gish. And you, remember Neanderthal man? Remember Neanderthal? You know, he was hunched over like this when they found him and they said, here he is, an ape man on the way up to becoming a human being. But you know, the first skeletons they found suffered from arthritis and rickets, a vitamin D deficiency, fluoride deficiency. It was a diseased skeleton. The poor guy, he wasn't on the way up, he was on the way down. You know, the opposite of what they think. And then you've probably heard of uh, Nebraska man. You heard of the Scopes trial? You know, at the Scopes trial, Nebraska man was one of these great evidences for an ape man. They found one tooth. And on the basis of one tooth, they built up the jaw and the skull and the backbone, the legs and arms, gave him flesh and hair and a mate and put the picture around the world. Later on, they found the tooth was attached to what? Skeleton of an extinct pig. And then to their embarrassment, they even found out the pig wasn't extinct. <laughs> Poor old Nebraska man. And then, of course, you have Peking man. What do they find? Bashed up skulls uh, of, of creatures that look like ape skulls and they find evidence of fire and, and evidence of stone tools. And, and what do you say? Wow, bashed in skulls and fire and, and stone tools. It's obvious, you know, apes becoming intelligent, building fire, using stone tools. Well, you know, there are places in the world today where they'll get a monkey, but it's too tough to eat its flesh, so they chop off its head, cook up its head, bash in the skull, eat the brains, which are a delicacy. In fact, if you saw uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, that's what, they that's what they serve for dessert, Peking man. And you see what happens is the scientist comes along and what does he say? Bashed in skulls, stone tools, fire, aha! Ape-like creature used stone tools. Uh-uh, stone tools used on ape-like creature. <laughs> you know, it wasn't man's ancestor, it was man's meal. And that's, that's where they got it all wrong. And we could go through all of those and we're going to uh, go through a number of those and you'll hear more details about that also uh, during the weekend. And then of course people say, well if God made Adam and Eve, if God made Adam and Eve, where did Cain get his wife? You know, it's an important question because you know I've met many, many, many people across this nation who've asked questions like, where did Cain get his wife? What happened to the dinosaurs? How do you get the races around the world? What about carbon-14? And because our pastor and because our parents couldn't answer the questions, we rejected Christianity. Mum and Dad, how many of you out there really can answer those questions for your children? How many can really defend the basics of the faith? Because I suggest to you, not that many. There'll be some, but not that many. And you know what? If we can't, why should our children say that Christianity is a logical and reasonable faith if you can't give answers to those things? Where did Cain get his wife? I was talking to a pastor once and he said, I never could answer that question. So when a man asked me, I used to say, what are you interested in somebody else's wife for? <laughs> he said, that sure stopped the question. Well, it might have, but it's a lousy answer. Where did Cain get his wife? Read Genesis 5.4. It says, Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. Daughters. Is that what you say? Daughters. You know how you sound to me? Terrible. <laughs> Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. In fact, uh, Jewish tradition, if you read Josephus, I just forget the exact number now, but I think it's 40 or 30 of each or something like that. Well, remember, Adam lived for 930 years, lots of time to have lots of kids. Eve was a superwoman. She was perfect when she was made. Not like any of you women out there, unfortunately. She was perfect. Like my wife said, five kids. That's it. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm at it. <laughs> she would have a, she'd have a million if she could. She just loves kids. We've got four Australians and one American. Well, 
multicultural family. Well, you know, Adam and Eve had sons and daughters, so where did Cain get his wife? Obviously his sister. And you say, but, but wait a minute. Brothers and sisters aren't allowed to marry. Even the Bible says brothers and sisters can't marry. Well, where does it say that? Leviticus. At, at the time of whom? Moses. What, why, what would happen if brother and sister married today? Problem. You see, you've all got mistakes in your genes. I mean, look around the room. I, I can see heaps of them just staring at me there. In fact... The only reason we call each, each other normals by common agreement more than anything. And you see, because of those mistakes, the more closely related you are, the more likely it is you have the same mistakes. So when the sperm fertilizes the egg, if you've got the same mistakes, guess what happens? Problem in the offspring. Further away in relationship, the more likely you've got different mistakes. So you get a good gene here and a bad gene, the good overrides the bad. Instead of getting deformed ears, you might just get crooked ones or something like that. Originally, Adam and Eve were perfect. Their genetic system was perfect. Marriage, after all, is one man for one woman, for life. So what would be morally wrong originally with brother and sister marriage? Nothing, as long as it's one man for one woman for life. And you see, probably wasn't until, well, I'd say hundreds of years, and I think particularly after the flood, when we believe the vapour canopy collapsed, and you have harsh conditions and mutations, mistakes in our genes adding up, that we get to a stage where God brought in that uh, law where uh, close intermarriage was then uh, outlawed. Remember, Abraham was married to his half-sister. And remember this too. In Corinthians, it says Adam was the first man. There was only one man. There wasn't a race of men. He was the first man. What does it say about Eve? She was called that name because she was to be the mother of some of the living? No, all the living. You have one man, one woman. What is Paul say in Acts 17, God made of one blood all nations that dwell on the earth. And now you're going to say to me, but how can you get all the different coloured people in the world? There aren't any different coloured people anywhere in the world. Every human being has the same colour. If I have a black person up beside me, that person is exactly the same colour as I am. They've just got more of it and that's all it is. You have a pigment called melanin. You can have a lot of it and be very dark, a little bit of it and you can be very light. You know, let me put it to you this way. Very, very simplistic. If mum and dad both have brown eyes, can you get blue eyes in a child? Yes, you can. We talk about dominant and recessive genes, and if they carry a recessive gene that gives blue eyes, you can get a child with blue eyes from parents who both have brown eyes. All right? If Adam and Eve had, say, four genes for skin colour, we believe there are at least four genes. A dominant A, a recessive A, a big B, little b right? Big A, little A, big B, little B. If they had those each, the children that got all the dominant genes could have lots of melanin, very dark, black in fact. Those that got all the recessives could be very light and you could be shades in between. There are families in the world that are basically like that today. I've seen a picture in, of twins born in England and one was very dark and one light. How could that happen? One got genes to produce lots of melanin, one got genes to produce not as much melanin. And I think what happened is this, at the time of the Tower of Babel, when God gave different languages, people split up, went to different places on the earth's surface, depending on the variations of genes they had in that population, due to isolation, inbreeding in that population, certain characteristics become dominant. And over the years, as certain genes die out of the population and so on, you, you get those cultural characteristics. That's easy to understand, isn't it? In fact, did you know that nearly every culture of the world, the Australian Aborigines, for instance, have legends about a world flood, woman made from man while he was asleep, about a forbidden tree. Most cultures of the world abound with stories like that. Why? They were handed down from the time of Noah. They've changed them. There's an element of truth, but the real record's in the Bible. It was handed down in written form. But people say, but writing wasn't invented to the time of Moses. Moses, were you there, were you? How do you know that? Some of the archaeological evidence today, like the Abla tablets, tells us writing was there before Moses. Not only that, Genesis 5 says this is a book of Adam. What are you saying? Adam could write? Who said he couldn't write? I mean, he was a, he was a primitive. Was he? He was the first man God made. He was the most intelligent human, other than Christ who, who came as a man. He was the most intelligent human that ever lived. We think, tend to think people before us aren't as good as us. But you know, it's the opposite is true. We're on the way down, not on the way up. Adam and Eve's descendants went out and built cities. They made musical instruments. 
Does that sound like a caveman learning to grunt, to learn to talk? And you say, well, what about the cavemen? Well, what are cavemen? Cavemen are men that live in caves. <laughs> and that's all they are. We've got real live cavemen in Australia. We've got a town called Cooper Pedy. It's so hot they live under the ground. They live in caves. They're not primitive people. They've got TV sets in their cave. <laughs> you know, it's about time we recognise that all people in the world go back to Adam and Eve. Because, you know, one of your famous paleontologists, you know Sir Henry Fairfield Osborne, the first half of the 20th century, do you know what he said? The adult Negro only has the IQ of a 12-year-old Caucasian. He believed they hadn't evolved as far as others. They're just a primitive race. Where do you think many of the racist ideas came from? Do you know what they said about the Aborigines? They said that they were the missing link. How do you think they treated them in regard to that? And, and even terms like mongoloid, you know, we, we, people have used that term in regard to certain uh, defective, uh, mentally defective children. Why? Uh, Stephen Gould from Harvard Uni University said they use that term because they believe the mongoloid race hadn't evolved as far as the Caucasian, so when you have such a child it's a throwback to its evolutionary ancestry. Where do you think our racist ideas come from? A lot of it comes from evolution. And you know, in this nation, there are many racist ideas and people look on, down on certain cultures and, and you have racist attitudes and I believe it's about time we got back to a biblical view of the origin of races. We all go back to Adam and Eve. We are all of one blood. Every human being is, is the same colour. We all have the same problem called sin. We all need the same solution, Jesus Christ. And let's get back to a biblical view of the origin of races. We really need to do that. You know what's fascinating? I have a Newsweek article here, January 11, 1988. And you know what? The secular scientists have something interesting. They looked in our cells and in our mitochondria there's some DNA. And without going into all the details, you, you can get uh, uh, some of these articles from other magazines or you can get this one, Newsweek, January 11, 88. They came to a startling conclusion. You see that DNA in our mitochondria only came, comes from the woman. And their conclusion was this. Do you realise when we look at mitochondria across the world, all people must come from one woman. They called her name African Eve because man evolved in Africa. You can imagine the conclusion of the article. Wow, the Bible story is right after all. No, their conclusion was, why did all the other women that evolved die out? That's their conclusion. And you know what they're also saying now? They're saying, you know... That woman had to marry her father or her twin brother because, you see, we've all got to go back to one man. Even when the evidence fits with what the Bible says, they don't want to believe it. But even the secular scientists are looking at that sort of evidence now and starting to, uh, coming to conclusions that we've been telling them all along. There was one man and one woman. God made Adam and Eve. Well, the Bible says the world became so wicked that God sent a flood to destroy the world. He told a man called Noah to build a boat there was plenty of room for two of every kind of animal, seven of some. By the way, it says every. Does it say all but the dinosaurs? It says every. I believe dinosaurs went on board. There weren't hundreds of kinds. There were lots of varieties. I suspect less than 20 kinds, maybe, of dinosaurs. And he wouldn't have sent a fully grown one. He would have sent a young adult. I think the average size of a dinosaur skeleton anyway is something like the size of a, of a sheep. Some dinosaurs were small as mice, some were small as chickens. If they'd have survived to today, we might have had Kentucky Fried Dinosaur <laughs> instead of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And what happened? Fountains of the deep broke open, water ripping around the earth, ripping up billions of tons of sediments. What would you expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And what do you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. Isn't that fascinating? I just love saying that. I really do. And you see, I believe the dinosaurs went on the ark, the kangaroos went on the ark. What happened to the dinosaurs? Well, there's a lot of theories as to what happened to the dinosaurs. Um, I think that uh, they came off the ark. You ready for this? What happened to the dinosaurs? I think you can sum it up in two words. I think they died. Why did they die? You know, after the flood, harsh conditions, not as much food, people killing them. I think they just died out like a lot of other animals have died out. 
There's no mystery about the dinosaurs. They're no different to the other animals in, in the sense of what's happened to the history of this planet. And you know, there's a lot of evidence dinosaurs have lived up until recent times. You don't hear about it. You know why you don't hear about it? It doesn't fit with evolution. But you know, there's a lot of evidence around the world that the uh, fossil record, most of it anyway, not all of it, but most of it came from the flood. I think some came after the flood. You're going to see in a moment Dr. Steve Austin talk to you about Mount St. Helens. That is going to blow your minds. Because you know what he's going to show you? Things happened at Mount St. Helens that produced layers catastrophically that we would normally say took millions of years. Fascinating. It'll blow your minds, I tell you. It is just fascinating stuff. And you've got to see that stuff on Mount St. Helens. We have a video out there of the talk that Dr. Austin's going to do next for you. And believe me, I believe it is some of the most devastating, if not the best, devastating evidence against millions of years you're ever going to see. It is just fascinating. You know what? If you've got a skeptic you want to witness to, invite him home, sit him in a lounge chair, give him a donut and a cup of coffee, just happen to have this video here, plug it in, and uh, let them see that. It'll blow their mind. But you know what people say? Are you saying the fossil record came from Noah's flood? I think a lot of it did. Not all of it, but a lot of it. I think some of it came after the flood. But it takes millions of years to make a fossil. Let me show you my favourite fossil. There it is. It looks like a hat. Here's a hat, was a hat. It's not a hat. Well, it sort of is a hat. In fact, a miner left it in a mine in 1830. Dug it out 50 years later, found that it evolved from a soft hat into a hard hat. <laughs> it's now a petrified hat. It doesn't take millions of years to petrify something. It ju you just need the right conditions, that's all. And you know what? Noah's flood provided excellent conditions. You know, there's some intriguing evidence in Australia for the flood. For instance, if Noah's flood's true, it would have ripped up billions of tons of plants and it would have deposited them and dumped them over the earth. Do you find dumps of plants? In Australia, we have some coal deposits. You know what I mean by coal? Can you say coal? It's close. It's close. Keep practicing. This coal deposit here is 750 feet thick at its deepest part. Texans, eat your heart out. It averages 300 feet thick for 300 square miles. There are nine seams in this location. It sits on white clay. We went down there and said to the geologist, how did it get here? Swamp, millions of years ago. A lot of the trees have been identified. Yep, they're pine trees. Yep, pine trees don't grow in swamps. No, that is a little bit of a problem, but maybe they did in the past. Where's the soil from the swamp? Because it sits on white clay. Well, it is a little bit of a problem, but somehow we think the clay, uh, the soil was taken out and this clay was put in to replace it. Yeah, I could imagine suspending 300 feet thick for 300 square miles and doing that. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Do you know what that looks like? It was dumped there. And as Dr. Austin's going to tell you, it doesn't take millions of years to make coal. You can make it in a laboratory, even a laboratory. And it doesn't take that long. It doesn't take millions of years. There's fascinating evidence all over the world. I, I could, oh, look, I get excited talking about this because the evidence that's there is just, it really is exciting. This evidence that fits with what the Bible says. And you know, people say to me, well, if there's all that evidence there, why don't people believe it? Why don't they believe it? We're going to deal with this tomorrow morning in a big way. You know why they don't believe it? It's not because the evidence is not there. It's because of the implications. And you know what the implications are? If there's Adam in your ancestry, who sets the rules? God does, because he made you. But if there's ape in your ancestry, who sets the rules? You do. I was on Portland radio, you know, and this guy called up and he says, evolution is true, I've seen it in my daughter. <laughs> I thought, boy, I'd hate to date her. <laughs> and I asked him what, it, what he meant, and he said, well, you know, he said she took some antibiotics and the bugs became resistant. Ah, sir, you've got it wrong. The bugs didn't become resistant. Those that were resistant survived. That's like natural selection. That's not evolution, sir. But you know, unfortunately, many people think that ape is in their ancestry. And you see, the more people believe in evolution, why shouldn't they write their own rules? And I'm just going to sum up for you one of the things I'm doing tomorrow. It's very different to the Genesis Solution movie, but this sort of sums up the Genesis Solution movie too. You see, as a creationist, I know what right and wrong is. Why? Because I know that God is creator. I have the Bible. I have his word. I know what the laws are. I know that marriage is one man for one woman for life. Why? God made marriage. He made Adam and Eve. 
I know why I wear clothes. I know the rightful place for sex. Why? Because God sets the rules. I know what life is all about. Why? Because God is the one that gives purpose and meaning to life because he's the creator. But you see, if you believe you're a product of chance, and you know the more people are taught that, and unfortunately in California they've just passed a ruling by the state board to put more evolution into science classes. What are they teaching those children? You're an animal. You came from slime. You don't know why you're here and you don't know where you're going. Why shouldn't they abort babies? Why shouldn't they be a homosexual? Why shouldn't they do what they want with sex? Why shouldn't they write their own laws? You know the sad thing? We have such a fantastic message for the world. We know where we came from. We know why we're here. We know where we're going. And sadly, we know where the others are going. We have a fantastic message. But you know, many people in authority in the education system, people in authority at the zoo and other places don't want our children, they don't want the next generations to know there's a God who made them, who owns them, who loves them, who died for them, who rose from the dead, so they can spend eternity with him. Instead, they teach them that they're animals. You came from slime, you're just an animal, why not act like it? You know, the highest cause of death amongst teenagers, other than by accident in America today, is what? Suicide. Why? I came from slime, I'm an animal, there's no purpose and meaning to life, I don't know where I'm going, what's the use of all this? Bang! Because that is a consequence of not teaching the correct view of where we came from. Creation evolution is a vital issue. We're going to deal more with that tomorrow and uh, also tonight. Before we break, let me just mention to you, we have a lot of books out there, a lot of books. And we push the books not to make money. We push the books because we want you to get this material. And you know something? There are a lot of people in churches in this city that aren't here. There's a lot more people over at Aliceville tonight. We're running two conferences at the same time. And I believe you can take this message to those that aren't here, back to your church. And one way you can do it with the books. I want to emphasize to you, most of our support comes from donations. It doesn't come from, from book sales. But uh, we so want you to have these materials. One of my favorite books is that one because I wrote it. And uh, it's called The Lie Evolution, and that deals with a lot of what I say, uh, sort of a lot of my talks together in one, and, and uh, has lots of little logical examples to fight the evolutionist, and has a lot of my diagrams in there, things that you saw in the Genesis Solution movie, has an Australian accent. It, it's, 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 um, it's a really, one of my, it really is uh, a sort of a summary of a lot of what I say. We have books like this, The Great Dinosaur Mystery in the Bible, not just a children's book. It deals with what happened to the dinosaurs. Did they go on the ark and come off the ark and the evidence they existed in present times? Tremendous book for children and for mums and dads. Right? Pretend you're buying it for your grandkids and you can be buying it for yourself. We don't need to know. It's that sort of book. But you can get that book together with this one in a special pack called a children's pack. Dr. Morris writes about Noah's ark and his search for the ark and uh, he, he talks about uh, dinosaurs as well. And that children's pack, tremendous gift. By the way, Christmas is coming up, isn't it? Why not consider giving dinosaur books away to your grandchildren, nieces, nephews? I mean, if, if your children or children you give presents to are like mine, they get these presents in these boxes. They like the boxes rather than what's in the present. And then three hours later, you throw it away anyway because it broke. Well, I'll give them a book that they can read. And you know something? Maybe their non-Christian mums and dads will read the same book too. Tremendous witnessing idea. We have this book. Uh, what is creation science? Dr. Parker and Dr. Morris wrote it. Dr. Parker used to be an evolutionist, became a creationist, and he knows the best arguments for evolution because he taught them in colleges. And so the best arguments for evolution in high school and college are refuted, and he knows how to do it. Tremendous book dealing with evidences. And you can get in the same pack Dr. Gish's book. This is the best book dealing with the fossil record and the ape men, the best one around. You will not be able to get a better book that details the fossil record and the ape men. Those two books together are called our layman's pack and they're full of facts, tremendous facts. Uh, this one here, this really is my favourite. I call it the Rolls-Royce of creation books. We have lots of them out there and if I can encourage you to buy one book, and buy this one. Dr. Henry Morris goes verse by verse through the whole book of Genesis. He shows how all your doctrine goes back to Genesis. He answers a lot of those questions we have, how the evidence fits. It's easy to read. It's easy for the layman to read. It's a scientific devotional. I encourage fathers to use it as a devotional during the year. It is a very special book. Twelve years ago, because I read that, that's the reason I can be here tonight. And that's why I encourage everyone to grab hold of a